Today we're going to talk about select focus. We're going to concentrate on um, using select focus to enhance the composition of a photograph. Uh, this is actually a really easy way for you as a photographer to keep mergers from being a problem. So we need to start off with the vocab. So aperture we've already sort of talked about uh, when we did the DSLR, but just to make sure that we're on the same page with this. Uh, aperture is how much light is allowed into and through the lens itself. Um, when we talk about shutter in the next shooting assignment, that's how long the light's allowed in. This is how much can come into the camera. Aperture priority, again, you should remember from the DSLR uh, quiz, uh, is simply a setting on your camera that will allow you as a photographer to adjust just the aperture. The camera will adjust everything else for you. I'd highly recommend for this shooting assignment that you focus on using aperture priority. If you're interested in uh, using uh, the full manual mode, we can talk about that uh, at a later time. So you're either going to do this in manual mode, but again, I would highly recommend shooting in aperture priority. It'll make your life easier. Uh, the next term is f-stop. This is actually the number that is associated with uh, an aperture at a given focal length. This is actually a ratio number, uh, and it has to do with the width of the opening versus the uh, focal length. Um, you don't need to know the formula to do that, but you could actually look up a formula to calculate aperture. Uh, the scale that I have there is a generic scale um, for a generic um, 35 millimeter lens. Um, that runs from a the largest opening of a 1.4 to the smallest opening of a, a 22. Each of these are called stops, uh, and a 1.4 uh, is the largest. It's the the largest opening, smallest number. Every time you change a stop, a full stop, um, you have the light that's coming in. So uh, technically, a 1.4. Um, stopping down to an f2 will actually cut um, the amount of light coming in by half. So just to sort of show you the mechanics of it, this is a uh, f-stop in this particular lens of a 2.8. Um, again, that has to do with what glass is in front of it. This is actually um, a, a photograph of a wide open aperture. This lets in the, the most light. Um, the larger, again, the aperture, the smaller the f-stop is. Uh, here we're showing an f8. This is about the mid-stop, uh, and this lets in a lot less light than the larger aperture, but it's actually the best use of the optics. The glass in the lens, this is the thickest part. It has the least amount of blemishes. Um, so if you're just going for you don't care what your depth of field is to get your best uh, looking images, shooting at a mid um, aperture setting is going to give you your best imagery. And then at an f22, this is the smallest that that hole will get in the lens. Um, and this is going to have an effect on what's in focus. So again, the smaller the actual opening, the larger the number. So what this whole thing is about, and the reason we need to know about the f-stops and all of those things is because of this thing called depth of field. And depth of field, um, at its base, is a zone of apparent image sharpness. Um, another way of looking at that, it's the area in front of and behind the point of focus that will stay in focus. Um, so if you think about shooting a... Uh, image of your best friend, the camera focuses on them. The zone of apparent image sharpness is how much in front of your friend and behind your friend is actually clear. And we can control that using the aperture. So again, the aperture uh, affects that depth of field. Uh, and these uh, definitions, this information's uh, coming from the Handbook of Photography, 6th uh, edition. So in this image, I have a picture of one of the keyboards down in the coral room. Um, this is a large aperture. So in this image, for that lens, it was an f4. That was the smallest I could get for that focal length. Um, and you'll notice that uh, as you look, 
uh, there is an area, the red dot, that area is in focus. Everything in front of or behind starts to get out of focus and you'll notice really between those green lines um, that's the most in focus. The further away uh, outside of those, above or below the green lines you get, um, the less is in focus. So the keys at the very um, bottom of the image um, are way out of focus to the point you can't even see the really the lines in between the keys uh, on the white keys. If we adjust that aperture to a middle aperture, again in this uh, situation it's the best use of my optics um, and I have it set to a, a f8 um, and you'll see here I'm focused on almost the same area. I really haven't moved my camera, I just changed the setting. Um, and you'll see that now this area has gotten a lot larger. Um, there's more of the black keys that are in focus. You also notice at the bottom of the image the keys are not as blurred. I can now see the diff the lines in between each of the keys. And then here if I set to my smallest aperture or my largest or widest depth of field, um, here it's set at f22. Um, things are in focus in the foreground and the background so you can notice that the chairs and the wall in the background um, of the image are in focus um, and again I'm focused my camera is pointed and focusing in where the red dot is and really the only place that we have anything out of focus is right up against the camera um, so this is a demonstration of showing you things in a row uh, it's an easy way to show you depth of field a new term um, that I've just added in because I actually just learned uh, this term uh, about a year ago uh, is a concept called bokeh. It's actually a word that's based off of a, a Japanese word um, and it, it represents the visual quality of the parts of the image that are out of focus. Um, and it's dependent on the actual lens that you're using. Um, so when you have a uh, lens that you're shopping for you may see people talk about the bokeh it's how blurry the blurred image uh, part of the image is uh, so l different lenses are prized for the bokeh that they give you so in this comparison um, I actually took my D40 and this is the standard Nikkor 18 to 55 millimeter um, the numbers that are there, again, that's the ratio that's telling you how fast the lens is. So this is an okay lens. It's not super fast. Um, but you'll notice behind my wife's head, uh, the background is out of focus. But you'll notice it's kind of um, large globs. Um, it's not super smooth when you look, especially like the tree that's right behind her head. Um, you can see almost like white circles in it. Um, but when we take... Uh, a different lens so it's the same camera body all I did was change the lens and this is one of my newer lenses this is a Nikkor 35 millimeter um, and that that 1.8 is actually a pretty fast lens um, I've fallen in love with this lens and you'll notice they're both set to the same I actually set the 1855 to a 35 millimeter to make a direct comparison and you'll notice how much smoother the background is that tree it's not quite behind my wife's head this in this picture but you'll notice it's so much smoother than the tree um, on the in the left picture and so a lot of photographers are seeking lenses that will give you that much blurry background you'll notice it actually makes my wife stick out more um, in the image on the right than she does on the left so it really helps to separate her from the background um, this type of a lens is actually sought after by a portrait photographer, so if that's something you're interested in doing, you may want to actually start looking um, at fixed focal length lenses. Um, and that's what makes that Nikkor 35 um, millimeter so uh, versatile. It does not actually zoom, um, so it actually allows for the, the lens to be a, a lot faster. The last thing we need to talk about is bracketing. We did talk about this in the mapping um, uh, shooting assignment. And this is actually ta uh, taking the same image several times, but you're changing a setting. So what I want you guys to do for this assignment is you're going to be bracketing for a bunch of the, the photographs. You're going to take the same subject multiple times, 
um, and just change um, your apertures so that you can play with a depth of field and actually experiment um, with the same subject three different types of depth of field. So you're going to take three pictures in a row. The first picture is going to be uh, at the, the smallest stop, uh, a picture in the middle, and then um, uh, the picture with the largest um, aperture. And the example that I give here is actually looking at if I'm a professional and I want to learn what my camera does, I can actually go um, and purposely watch what the light meter says and do what we call stop down. Uh, which means I purposely lie to the light meter and I take the picture, I take a second picture of the same thing with what the light meter said and then I actually stop up um, and take a picture that's a little um, off of what the camera said again and then I can look at those images side by side. Again, you're going to be using bracketing here, just changing your aperture. We're not going to play with anything else. So technical review. Um, if you look at your cameras I need to make sure that you know how to set your camera to manual mode so it's been a little while since we've done this make sure you remember how to do that if you don't talk with each other or come ask me um, do you remember how to set it to aperture priority mode do you know how to make adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed in manual mode again for this I'd stick with just aperture uh, priority but if you wanted to play with aperture and shutter speed do you know how to change both of those things do you know how to make adjustment to the aperture in the aperture priority mode? Do you know how to adjust the ISO? This is something that you guys need to start thinking about as you're photographing because if you're inside, you want to be shooting uh, at like an ISO of 800, but if you're outside, you want to be like 400 or 200, it will help make your pictures better. Um, do you know how to change the metering mode? You really should be in spot metering. If you don't know how to change that, come see me. We'll make sure you're metering. It's going to help make your picture stronger. Um, and then if you're going to shoot in full manual, you need to know how to read a light meter. Um, do you know how to read the light meter in your camera? If you don't, by all means, we can talk about it um, at some point in class, and I can show you guys how to do it. So for this shooting assignment, we're going to actually split this assignment into a technical part um, and then a, a photographic or artistic part. Uh, so you're going to continue thinking about things like composition and lighting um, that we did it in photo one. Um, you're going to think about uh, how uh, the depth of field can actually affect uh, what you're doing. So I actually want you to f shoot the first part of this assignment Look over them and make sure you have them, and then go back and photograph for the second part uh, of the assignment. Um, you need to take at least 24 exposures. There's nothing new there. Um, anything you do in class for practice does not count towards that requirement. Um, you need to continue thinking about composition as much as you can. Um, and if you need to, as you're composing, you may need to know how to do your focus and, and uh, exposure lock. Again, figure out where those are in your camera. If you don't remember how to do that or you're having trouble, come see me. Um, you don't have to have all of those things present in every picture. Again, the first part, I really just want you to be able to see um, and capture depth of field of the same object. Um, so I'm not wor as worried about composition there, but then your final two images should um, think about those things. Um, again, think about lighting, things like 45 or 90. In the pictures you saw of my wife there, um, I purposely, we were outside and the sun was um, sort of in her face that I could get some uh, shadow on her face. Please do not use backlighting. Um, that Having that light source in your image, we're going to learn about that in a couple shooting assignments. You'll be able to crop. Um, you'll be able to adjust contrast and color, any of the other things you know how to do in, in Photoshop. Um, I'd still recommend you try and compose as much as you can in the camera because it saves you time. Uh, going through and editing in the computer. So you're going to have five final images out of the 24 that you're presenting for the final grade. The first three images are going to be the same subject. So just like I did with the keyboard, I want you guys to get a composition together, things in a row or looking down like a fence, 
uh, something where you have repeating objects that you can show ones are closer and further away from you is the easiest subject to do. And I actually want you to change your shutter speed. I'm sorry, I want you to change your aperture for each of the image. So in one of them, I want you to have a narrow depth of field. That means it's the smallest number. I want you to have one where it's in about the medium. So if you have to sit there and count from the smallest number to the largest number and divide that by half. Um, and then I want you to take that same image again with a wide depth of field or the largest f-stop. Um, so those first three images are going to basically be repeats, but I should see differences in the background. It should be really blurry in one, not as blurry in the second, and then uh, as clear as you can possibly get in the third one. The last two images are your choice. And they're meant to be, now that you've sort of played around with depth of field, can you get me two images where you use depth of field to your advantage? The idea being that it actually helps to get your subject to stick out from the background. Um, you know, if you want to do portrait, make sure you get the model release form signed. Um, but basically, I'm looking for you um, to show me that you understand what you're doing. So just to look at some examples, I'm just going to bring up um, the, the keyboard example. So you're going to photograph objects in a row. You're going to take the same picture without moving. Now I know I moved a little bit in each one um, and that's fine if you've moved a little bit but what I want to see is from left to right there you have less in, in focus around like the focal point. In the middle one I want you to have more in focus and then by the last one everything in the picture or darn near everything should be in focus. If you're having trouble getting these, you want to make sure you talk to me before these negatives are due. For the photographer's choice, um, I threw in three pictures from my cousin's wedding um, that I did a uh, couple years ago. And uh, here, this is the groom uh, getting ready. They're putting his um, flower on uh, for the wedding. And I wanted to use depth of field here to capture him. Uh, looking at himself in the mirror and it was sort of a poignant moment but you'll notice the reflections clear um, the windows in the reflection that are in the background are not as in focus and when you look at the back of his head and his shoulder um, he's way out of focus so again it really you have to look at his face in the mirror you're not really paying attention to him in this one this was actually taken by my mom who was assisting me uh, on this job and she took a picture of the bouquet. And again, using depth of field, you focus on um, the flowers themselves. The reflections in the mirror that are behind it become inconsequential because they're out of focus. And then, of course, the picture that everybody's after anymore, um, the two hands getting ready to cut the cake um, with the wedding bands on. Um, so the cake's in the background, uh, but I have that slightly out of focus, so you focus on the hands. So again, using depth of field, so I had three there, you only need two, um, but using depth of field to enhance uh, the image that you're taking. So what I want you guys to do right now is you need to go practice capturing uh, three levels of depth of field using a group of objects in the line. Um, you can do that over in the clay room, that's fine. But basically, you need to find things that are in a row or grab bottles of paint or whatever, put them in a row. You want to keep them spaced out, um, so don't jam them right together. It makes this a little bit harder to get. And then you want to like get as much light into the room as you can, so you might need to turn both sets of um, fluorescents on. But you're going to set your camera to the smallest f-stop um, and take a picture. Uh, you're going to, without moving, you're going to set your aperture to a middle number. Again, it's usually going to be like 8 or 9, somewhere in around there. Take a picture. Um, and then take a third picture where you're making it the largest number you can get before the camera freaks out. Uh, you may have to brace yourself really well for this because it may be low enough light. You may also need to uh, set your ISO to 800. You need to show me these images. Uh, so that we can look at them, whether that's in class today or if it's part of class tomorrow, uh, just to make sure that you guys know what you're doing and you're doing it right. Again, these images won't count towards your 24 negatives. Uh, so go ahead and practice if you have time.